So first of all, um, you obviously came to this particular lecture expecting something. And so what um, we will be talking about micro inequities. We'll kind of talk about what those, what those are, how those show up. Um, what other things were you expecting to have conversations about by coming here at, at, on, on the lunch hour? What were some of your expectations? To learn. To learn, OK. Yeah. I know uh, talking about Ferguson and uh, Staten Island, you know, those are not micro, <laughs> those are macro, but kind of that's just been weighing on me. And I wondered if there had a discussion around that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I can, we can't have a conversation uh, gathered together without having addressed those things, particularly when we start talking about diversity and inclusion and that kind of stuff. So um, th those kind of macro aggressions, uh, I would I would say, um, are important for us to discuss. All right. So we will discuss that. Yes, ma'am. And in, the, in that same light. Uh, because the world is diverse and eclectic and all that, another strategy for bringing your whole self into an environment without penalty or criticism. Okay. So how to bring your whole self into an environment without penalty or criticism. Uh, I'll give you a short answer on how to do that. You can't. But, okay, I uh, that. <laughs> but, but, but we'll talk about how do you insulate yourself in such a way that as those, as those uh, assaults come to you, you have a buffer, uh, and you also have allies, right? So um, it's funny, as adults, we like to pretend that we don't succumb to peer pressure, <laughs> that, that that is just something that young people have to deal with, right? Um, but we succumb to peer pressure all the time, right? So I'm looking at certain people, the way they wear, wear their scarves. Uh, it, it is a statement on how you wear your scarf, right? So you know, if you have the double, uh, double tuck, if you have the, 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 the single wrap versus the double wrap and, and, and all those things. And part of that is because it's our personal preference. But a part, the other part of that is because that's the normative behavior, right? Most of, our, uh, most of us, uh, it looks like we're mostly wearing, uh, wearing pants. And most of these pants look as though they fasten in the front. Um, but I remember a, a group called Crisscross who was trying to be counterculture, and they had their fasteners for their pants on the back. So they wore their pants backwards uh, to, to try to make a statement, and fortunately, that statement did not last. <laughs> so um, there are very few people who put on their pants backwards in order to make a statement these days uh, because there's some normative behavior. And so when we start talking about these micro inequities, uh, one of the things that I will, I will tell you is that people, and you've experienced this yourself, people who acts, act outside of the normative behavior, uh, first of all, are defensive of their behavior, and secondly, don't, see, don't necessarily see that their behavior is aberrant, and thirdly, um, will fight against anything that is um, counter how they've been acting with the world. Right? So, for example, um, you see a, a, a bigoted or a racist person uh, or a prejudiced person behaving, and you draw attention to that behavior, what is their first response? No, Defense. Defense, right? No, it's, I'm not that, right? It, it, it was just a joke. It was blah, blah, blah. So, so there's a defense. But if you press them a little further, then what happens? They so after they get past the defense mechanism, and you keep pressing them on it, what, what happens next? They What's get the, angry. They get angry, yeah. right? And then after that anger, what, what comes after that? Fear, attack. A, a, attack. Right, so uh, fear, attack, a, a aggression, right? They, they get into a position where they're, uh, they are now going to defend, even if they don't totally understand or believe um, what they've done is inappropriate or, or whatnot, they will defend that thing. And so um, we have to be mindful of that when we start talking about what it means to, to deal with microaggressions. Now, to start having our conversations about microaggressions, we have to start with one basic premise. And this seems like a simplistic premise, but it's actually a difficult um, 
premise when it's acted out, particularly in systems, right? So, um, I have a, um, a, 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 a male human and a female human who participate in the reproductive process. What is the result, if they are successful in, in attempting to reproduce, what is the result of a male human and a female human participating in the reproductive process? A, a, a child what? Reproduction. Offspring what? Of them. Of them being? Human. 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 So human plus human equals human. human. human right? So uh, a, a, a Canadian and a, uh, a person from the Democratic Republic, Republic of the Congo fall in love, mate, participate in this reproductive activity. What is the result? A human baby. A human baby. Um, a, a person from, um, from, from, from China and a person from Brazil fall in love, participate in this reproductive process. What is the result? A human baby. A black person and a white person. Engage in this reproductive process. What is the result? A human baby. A human baby. Why do I bring up those exaggerated um, uh, ways of, of thinking about th this reproductive process in, in regards to t talking about microinequities? Why do I bring those things up? Because they aren't seen as human being outside of the norm of a like and a like. It doesn't matter what these, what this human and this human is. It still produces a human, but we don't see it that way. We see. What what, what do we see? If, if I see it, we see a right and a wrong. We see a right and a wrong. We see a culture, this culture and that culture, blah blah. blah. Um, we typically yeah, refer to thanks. people as being, you know, biracial. Hello, how are you? Hello. Hello. Um, I have a couple of sandwiches left. I think there's a turkey and a vegetarian sandwich if you're. Interested? I would say not everyone. Well, no, 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 not everyone, right? So, so what else do people see? I think, in, like you bring it back to Ferguson, you know, it's like some lives are considered more valuable, matter more than others, you know? So, the, like all this protest is black lives matter because, in some, you know, it doesn't seem that way in some. Okay, so some in so some circumstances it doesn't seem as though Black Lives Matter. Some people have prejudicial attitudes about mixing race, and they might um, sometimes say things that are hurtful to others. Yeah, and why do people have prejudicial attitudes about mixing races? They learn that from Be someone. Because they learn that from someone, and what's the underlying? What's the underpinning of those? Uh, 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 of that uh, racial bigotry. Fear. Vertical thinking? Fear. Yeah. Separation. Fear. 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 Separation. Separation. Mm -hmm. the, the underlying uh, thinking of that is that we are not equally human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That some groups are more human than other groups. Hello. How are you? Hi. Good, good, good. So some groups are more human than others. But when we back up and we say we're equally human, we have different cultures because we're adapting to different geographic regions on the planet, right? We're, we, we've grown up in, in different times, um, but our humanity is the same. Now, what I'm not su suggesting, particularly as practitioners, is that we have people denounce whatever racial category that they uh, associate themselves with and just go with the label human. Um, because I don't have the right to do that to another person. I can't say, you can't say you're black or you can't say you're white because you're human. I don't have the right to say that. They have to come into the, 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 the knowledge themselves. However, as a practitioner, I have to know that even if I haven't grown up in those, that, that person's neighborhood, if I haven't um, had the same experiences as that person, one of the things that we have in common is our human experience. Right? So I know, I know what it's like to have lost someone. I know what it's like to, to, to yearn for something. I, I, I know what the human experience is. And so that becomes our, our first premise for, uh, for dealing with these micro inequities because the absence of recognizing that the person across from me is more similar to me than they are different 
leads to these microaggressions, uh, these, these micro inequities. And, and what I would say is that micro inequities and microaggressions lead to um, hate crimes, lead to murder, me, me, lead to the maiming of individuals and trying to rob them of their humanity. And so um, that's why it's important for us to recognize. I, I don't necessarily have to verbalize it. I don't have to necessarily, you know, declare to the world that, you know, all people are just human. But I do, as a practitioner, have to recognize that there's not much difference between um, my client. There's not much difference between my coworkers than me. There are simply obstacle illusions. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those obstacle illusions as well. Anything else people were interested in, in having a conversation about as you kind of walked into th this, this lecture today? Maybe the reaction to that, like as a practitioner, um, to, 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 like, you know, somebody learns to be a certain way, like very, you know, or maybe racist or sexist or whatever it is, and, you know, like you were saying, you can't, like, make them, s they have to learn it on their own, yeah. and how to deal with what comes up for you and at the same time. Because you are human, you're yep. going to be affected by it. So, yeah, so, so, what are, so how do you deal with that, right? So how do you teach, how do you help somebody grow that, that may be feeling those, those uh, that way around prejudice or, or whatnot? Um, and hopefully we'll get to, we'll get to that in, 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 uh, in our session, all right? Um, so, yeah, no, I definitely will we'll do that because it would be, unfair for us to open up this, this Pandora's box and not have some solutions for you to, uh, to walk away with. So, so I will uh, make sure that that happens. Um, so let's go to our, uh, our, our handout. There are a couple of things that uh, I wanted to kind of point out. And a lot of these things are things that uh, many of you who have sat in lectures that I've done before are maybe familiar with and uh, and they're also kind of at layer, these Atlarian pieces, right? So one of the things that we're constantly striving, well, what are the three things that uh, Atlarians believe that people are striving for, that we're, we're trying to attain? Yes? Belonging, safety, and significance. Yep, significance, belonging, and safety. Significance, belonging, and safety. Um, when we think about cultural differences, Cultures are trying to reach safety, significance, and belonging. The way that they do that is different given their, their time frame, given their resources, and given their geographic locations, right? So um, in, in Minnesota, well, I, I think it's really funny right now in Minnesota, we have better weather than Southern California and Northern <laughs> California. They're getting blizzards, and we're having a heat wave, you know? But traditionally, there are certain ways that we behave here in Minnesota uh, because of our geographic location that they don't in Southern California, right? So in the winter, we usually, what kinds of activities do we participate in in the winter? Snowball Skiing. fight. Hibernating. Snowball fight. <laughs> Hibernating. <laughs> Snowball fight. Sledding. Uh, ice skating. Sledding, ice skating, hockey, uh, hockey uh, uh, ice fishing, skiing, all, all these things. And they don't do those. In, in, and so there's a culture around those, those things here in Minnesota that uh, does not exist in Florida or, or California because of the geographic location, right? So, so culture is human beings uh, attempt to adapt to their context. And that context can be um, time related, it can be space related, can be uh, geographically uh, located. It can also, uh, governments and, and educational systems also play into that, that context. So. Um, so I want to talk uh, about some barriers to humanity. So what are some barriers to people getting safety, significance, and belonging? One of those is ho historical trauma. And the context that I want to talk about historical trauma um, is with the Native American uh, community. So historical trauma for Native Americans, if you can imagine or walk through this uh, scenario with me, um, how many people have had a, a vehicle stolen? Has anyone had a car stolen? Okay. Cool. What, what kind of car was that? Toyota. It was a Toyota. All right. So do you know what your Toyota looks like? Yes. So if you saw, so did you eventually get your Toyota back? I did. You did. 
I would imagine it was not in the same condition as it was when you, yeah when it was st stolen, right? So you so uh, you had a Toyota stolen. Now, um, can I use that for this example? Is it okay? Cool, because I don't want to re-victimize you, but I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to at least use use this as a, a teachable point. So um, one of the things that uh, so I'd imagine. Um, so walk with me through this, this, this parable, if you will. So let's say um, your, uh, come on in. So let's say your, your car is stolen, and um, you come home Tuesday night after your car has been stolen, and you see your car in your neighbor's driveway. How do you feel about that? Okay, so you're confused. Anybody else confused? I'm angry. Oh, so you're angry. All right. So, so we have confusion. We have anger. All right. What's your first reaction to that? I'm gonna go get my car. Okay, I'm gonna go get my car. You're like, what? What's wrong with you know? Hey, right. So, so, so you go over there to to try to get your car, and what do you say to the neighbor? Why do you have my car? Why do you have my car? Did I need? What's car? up? Right. So the neighbor has these two ginormous. Pit bull, piranha, uh, shark, Rottweilers, you know, and then and they're just ah, and they're salivating and all this kind of stuff. And um, and the neighbor says, "It's not your car. It's my car. Get off my property." What do you do? Call the police. So you call the police. So the police come, and what do the police do? They say, "Why you got?" They say, why do you have her car? And they take a report, and then they go back to doing whatever it was they were doing, right? So um, sometimes I'm, I, I, I thought they would come with like a CIS kit or something, you know, dust or fingerprints or something, you know, use a little blue light thing. And, you know. But um, so, so again, we're, we're, we're working through this parable, right? So, uh, so how do I feel about my neighbor right now? Angry. Angry, right? So... Um, the police aren't able to help me get my car. There's some, some, some stuff going on between my neighbor and I. But the neighbor gets to keep the car, and they keep using the car. And so I take the neighbor to court. And so I, I bring all my paperwork into court. Um, I present it to the judge. The judge is looking through it, really you know, paying a lot of attention to all the details. I have my, my oil changes, my insurance, my, all these things that prove that this is my car. And the judge looks at my neighbor and says, neighbor, what do you have to present? The neighbor says, I don't have anything. And the judge goes, uh-huh. And so the, the judge, uh, you know, makes, uh, makes her decision. She uh, takes her gavel and she bangs it on the, uh, on, on the, on the stand. And she goes, uh, I've made my decision. The car goes to the neighbor. Wait a minute. So how do you feel about this justice system? Injustice. That is unjust, right? So not only do you feel bad about your neighbor, you feel bad about the justice system. What do you? How do you feel about the, the folks who came and took the report? How do you think? What do you feel about the police? Were they were they necessarily helpful? Right? Yeah. So you're angry, right? So now six months passes. You've been watching your neighbor use your car, going back and forth, and now the your your neighborhood decides to have a car show for childhood leukemia. And so uh, the neighbor comes across the street and says, you know what, I know you know something about Toyotas. Could you help me fix this car up for the neighborhood leukemia car show? Absolutely not. Just so you say absolutely not at best, right? <laughs> right? Um, how do you feel now about leukemia? Right? So no, you don't even want to participate in something that you might think is important, right? Uh, how do you feel about your neighbor? You don't like your neighbor. You don't like the justice system. So what do you do with those feelings? Project. So in some cases, I may project them. How else might I deal with those feelings? Shut them down. Shut them I might down. internalize those in the, the, that, that, that oppression, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what typically happens when uh, mm -hmm. with Native Americans or, or, or the, the mythos that that uh, particularly as helping professionals we typically operate with is that because the external environment has been so hostile that many folks say because I can't get ahead and if I can't control the outside world what I can't control is myself mm -hmm. and so people say well why do those people have have babies they can't afford because I can't control anything outside of me but I can control myself right um, I might not have uh, 
be affirmed by the world, but I can get some affirmation in my own family, in my own household. Um, and people oftentimes take the, the, the extreme that says, you know what, if the world is out to kill me, I'd rather do it myself than let the world do it to me. Right? So when we have that hopelessness, that historical trauma, and, and the problem um, that is presented by that terminology of historical trauma is that the historical piece, particularly with, with Native Americans, this, tra this, this traumatic American experience happens every day. They get to see everything that used to belong to them being used by someone else. And then those other people say, well, you can hunt and fish and rice between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, but don't be late. Right? You can use the car between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, but don't be late. Um, and so what kind of effect does that have? And so how do we counteract that historical trauma? We start honoring what people say they need as opposed to what systems say that people need. Right? Um, so, so there's that point. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, institutional racism. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was given. So President Lincoln gave the... the, uh, the the address that, that said that uh, all people held in slavery, particularly in the South, in the South, would be freed, 1863. What I find interesting is that it is not until 1964 is there an amendment that directly addresses what was supposed to be provided in 1863 or the ratification that happened in 1865. Right? So it was ratified in 1865, um, which meant that in 1865 and beyond, folks should have had equal access to everything because that's what uh, the, 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 the 13th Amendment uh, offers us. However, it's not till 1964. So from 1863 to 1964, how long of a time period is that? 101 years. It's 101 years. What kinds of things happen in the world in that 101 years? A lot. A lot. Like what? Telephone. Wars. Two world wars. Two world wars. What was that? Telephone. The telephone was it, it invented, created. Cars. We went from carriages to cars, uh, electricity, and homes, right? We added 22 states to the United States in that period of time. And so when people talk about institutional racism, I would suggest that anything that is uh, created where not everyone gets to benefit from is, by its definition and its creation, racist. And so, um, you know, towns and cities that did not allow um, people of color, particularly black people or Asians, um, Japanese or, or, or Chinese or Hispanics to participate uh, as equal members in those advances uh, I would say is a racist institution. And so we have, uh, we have that to recover from, and we, and we can do that, right? We can re we do that as we move forward. Um, some might argue, uh, you know, why 1863? Uh, there were uh, other institutions that were created long before that, but I wanted to use the 1863 as a, as a starting point because sometimes when we try to do all of history, particularly American history, it gets so obtuse that we can't focus on... Um, on more germane topics, right? So we can't keep focus. Um, so, so historical racism is, is important. Um, poverty is a problem in terms of, uh, of being a barrier to, to uh, humanity. And what I don't like is how we've crouched the conversation of poverty. Um, t when we talk about poverty, what we're typically talking about are the people who are victims um, and, and, and maybe that's not the, the, the right term, but the people who are being damaged by something that typically is outside of their control, which is inequity. So we talk about poverty because we put that on individual people, but what we're actually talking about is the system of inequity. And um, if you can imagine, um, no, oh, 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 no, this is great. So I don't know if you've ever been to a big public event like maybe at the, the, the Target Center or the Excel Center, um, because we, we need to differentiate between equity and equality. Equity and equality. Now, gentlemen, 
when we go to those events, in those big public events, how long does it usually take for us to, to use the, the restroom facilities? Is it a long time or does it take a short amount of time? It's a long time. Oh, it's a long time. Okay. Okay, so there are lines. Okay. Um, women. <laughs> women, given what we've said as men, that there are lines and it takes a, a long time, how long does it take for women to... Okay, so it takes a... It takes a really long time. So if it's a long time for men, it's a really long time for, for women. The problem, why it takes so much longer for women to use the restroom than for men to use the restroom, is because of equality. There are just as many restrooms for men and for women, so it's equal. Do men and women have the same uh, experience in the access of that equality? No. no, no. no. Why? Well. The functions of uh, the nature of the individuals in that equal system do not, present, do, do not uh, result in equal uh, benefits of that system. Right? right. You know, so, so because women have a whole different kind of process that they, that they go through. Um, and, and I find it interesting that I have figured out why it takes women longer to use the restroom, and it's because of the little mailboxes. I don't know why women take time to write little letters and put them, and who picks up that mail? You know, it is, you know. Okay, that was a bad joke, bad joke, bad joke. <laughs> right? So, so equality says that we will create this mandate and everyone will have equal access to, to this stuff. But in actuality, what we're seeking is equity. And so what would be equitable is to have twice the number of women's restrooms uh, as it pertains to men's restroom because they use the restroom facilities differently, right? And so when we talk about this, this concept of, of poverty, what we're actually talking about is inequity. We're talking about systems that people operate in that have been set up um, to, to, be, uh, to have some people have advantages and others disadvantages. All right? um, and then lastly, the, the concept of whiteness is problematic in establishing uh, people's humanity. And, and how many people on an HR forum would declare themselves as white? Okay, cool. Um, where is white? Well, that's a choice they give a lot. Okay, that's a choice yeah. that they give a lot. They don't give us a, they're, they're really qualifying choices. Okay, they don't give you really, they don't give you really. The system, government. The system, government. Okay, or, yes ma'am. I, I guess if you're asking why, it's because I would choose other, but then I'm afraid that I'm not representing, or I'm not giving the opportunity for people who may be at a disadvantage. Okay. And so I've left. So you have to go through these mental gymnastics before you even check that stuff, right? Because I want people who may be at a disadvantage to be identified outside of me. Because okay. I have certain opportunities that other people don't. Okay, cool. Because you want other people to be identified because you have certain opportunities that other people don't. All right? Yes. Yes, sir. I, I, um, I, I, my question might be outside of what you're Okay, so so you're saying Europeans have more of a chance to change from European to white. Right. Okay. Of, you know, in addition to Asian or other people, because we, our color will never change. Okay, so our color will never change. Um, so so this one I want to offer. I, I want to ask you, um, because where is black? Right? So, uh, those of you who, who declared yourselves as white, uh, anyone have family members from Germany, uh, Poland, um, Norway, Sweden, Germany, England, um, Spain, France? I'm running out of 
my European Italy. countries. <laughs> Italy. <laughs> Italy. Italy. Czechoslovakia. 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 What's that? Slovakia. Uh, okay. Uh, Ireland, right? Yep. Why did I ask you the second set of questions as opposed to the, this whiteness? It differentiates. Because it differentiates? Your ancestry. What about your ancestry? It's your genetic ancestry of your... Your family tie, where you come from, where your family came from over here, because a lot of us, uh, I think, weren't originally in North America. So, all of us, even the Native Americans, came from someplace else before so, there were people here, so right? You can trace back your heredity. Because people come from places. Yeah. yeah. Right. So when I when I say that uh, when I say what that that uh, that I am white or that I am black, I don't know what place I come from. Exactly. Right. And so people come from places. And so now it, people will say, well, are you a, a, a separatist? Why can't we just all be Americans? Why can't we all just be people? And I believe that that day will come, and it is not today. <laughs> Because I've tried that. I've tried to say, well, I'm just, well, you know, people will say, well, where are you from? Right? Uh, you know, are you from here? No, yes, I am from here. So stop asking me. Right? Um, but but that, that is not today. So that, that will come. The, the point being that, that whiteness and blackness and even the definition of Asian, these are all political constructs designed by governments to keep people, the, the racial consciousness is, is designed to keep people separate. Are there differences, physical differences between people? Yes, but those are illusions. Um, at, at, at our genetic makeup, we are relatively the, the, same. the same. We are more same than we're, than we're not. And so the hair and the nose and the, the, uh, the, the, the skin texture, those are all illusions that present a false, um, actually present a false humanity to us, right? Our real humanity does not come from what we look like, it comes from what we value, how we interact with each other, how we treat um, one another. So, um, so those are important. Can I ask you a quick yes, question? Yes, yes. So, um, that being said, sometimes when something is uh, kind of more or less splitting people and, you know, putting them in a label category, um, at the same time, do you think that it can be beneficial in some ways or, like, there's just a better way to do it, but... Like for that one example, the purpose, and I don't think that it's served very well, is so that more and more um, minorities are being hired and more, you know, there's more diversity in the workplace. I'm not sure that's actually happening, but, right, so. So th th this is, so no, it, it, I, I think trying to um, count numbers and count um, Kind of our differences. I actually think that exacerbates the problem. Um, I, I think when individuals are able and systems are able to go to a place. To, here, here's an example. So I was a affirmative action officer at Anoka County, and um, a number of applicants came across my desk. And so when we start talking, to, so a number of applicants came across my desk. We had a um, a license bureau. Um, position open, and so the license, that, that's where, you know, government meets the, 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 the community, right? So people come to get their tabs, they come to take care of their fishing stuff, all that stuff. So there was uh, a position open, and there was a woman that was in the office that had been a temp for two years. So she knows the system, she knows the people there, they have a great rapport, and she's good at what she does. Um, then there was a person who, uh, who, who had applied, who was coming from Ramsey County, and part of her duties at Ramsey County was to be a Hmong interpreter. Um, and so they, they applied, and the person, because of uh, seniority and having some uh, experience with the, the, the county, had a few extra points than this other person in terms of what they looked like. And so um, the, 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 the rationale, obviously, is when we talk about what's equal, that the system says, pick the person with the highest score, right? That's what that's what being equal would look like, and so um, so knowing this, and I, I saw the the scores, and I saw the stuff that 
come, came across my desk, uh, I went to the hiring manager, and I just asked the hiring manager this question. I said, uh, which out of these two candidates who are statistically the same, right? So the, the, the score difference, although one was a little bit higher, but statistically they would be relatively the same. I said, between these two individuals, which of these individuals keeps us at the same high level of excellence that we currently have in the county? And which one of these individuals expands our capacity to serve in ways that we haven't yet experienced in the county. So which one of them uh, keeps us at, at a high level and which one of them expands our capacity? And so I gave that, that choice to them. And so they looked at the goals of the organization. They looked at um, how what we needed to, to continue to be successful. And they made their decision. And guess what the decision was? The Hmong interpreter. They chose the Hmong interpreter. Right? The, the woman who came from Ramsey County, who statistically would have been number two, but they chose her for number one. And why was that? Because they were looking at the needs of the organization. And so part of that, you know, do we need to count these people? Do we need blah, blah, blah? Um, until we can get to a point where we can look at the needs of the organization and what's actually best for the organization, um, some of those things may need to still be a conscious practice until they become subconscious and we actually get some results, you know? So, um, yes, ma'am. You, you made the statement, and I lost the word, forgive me. You said, our humanity comes from blank, not from what we look like. Our values? Our values. Yeah, from our values. values. Our, our humanity comes from our values. I lost the word. Yep. So, uh, so there's two, when we start talking about um, microaggressions and microinequities, there are two concepts that, um, that I lean on particularly when I'm not feeling strong myself. Because sometimes I can't make the argument that needs to be made or I'm not as articulate as, as I'd like to be. And so I lean on something that is a non-negotiable in the United States, which is the Constitution. Right? So I lean on the laws um, because I found that that's been an effective way that my predecessors have also found change. Right? So... Um, the, the season of intent. So let's just read that real quick. Laws have been created to deal with, manage, and give consequences for larger social, Ill, social ills. Intent versus impact. Right. So that's the definition of intent versus impact. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm walking, um, I mean impact versus intent. So I'm walking down the hall um, and a co-worker swats me on the butt and we're not on the softball team together. We have a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah, what is that, what is that problem called? Sexual harassment. It's called sexual harassment, right? And what do I do if I feel that I've been sexually harassed? Report it. I report it to who? HR. To HR, right? Um, if HR does not give me satisfaction, then what do I do? I go higher up, right? And if the organization's not uh, helpful, then I go to, you know, the, the state, or I go to the county, human rights commissions, I go to all of these external, or, or I sue. So I'm using what process to, um, to remedy this sexual harassment? Legal. I'm using the legal process, right? And so, the, so what if I, I, I swat, uh, that, that coworker swats me on the butt, and they say, I'm just joking. I'm sorry. I, you know, it was it was a joke. You know me, and that's not. So, what what does the the, the court say about that? Do they say, oh, we understand that's your bad. We're gonna let it go, right? Does the court say that? No. no. What is the court paying attention to? Intent. The, they are paying attention to impact, impact. right? So my intention, you know, I could say I was just joking, I didn't mean it, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what the court measures. The court measures the impact of what you do, right? So, so that's important when we start talking about micro inequities and microaggressions. So let's go to the, to the second part. Human relation work, in, in human relations work, we talk about and deal with and learn to manage human behavior. So in, in human relations work, we're talking about intent versus impact. Have any of you received a gift from someone that didn't want to give it to you? 
They were forced, conjoled, uh, convinced to give you that apology or to give you this present. And they go, here. How do you take that? You don't want it, right? You, you don't even want You're like, you just keep your thing. But have you also been given a, 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 a gift, particularly children are good for this, right? They'll, they'll make a little uh, turkey out of their hand, or they give, have a macaroni drawing that they've created that's not really very good, right? But they, they give it to you, they present it to you as if it is gold. And how do you receive that shoddy gift, <laughs> that ugly tie, that... <laughs> Right? You keep it for you. You might even bronze their baby shoes because, because it is it's not the impact of that gift. It is the intent. intent. Right? Yeah. And so when we start talking about microaggressions, it is not the impact that is in terms of human relations that we want to, 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 to deal with. It is the intent of our human relations that we want to deal with. Because what is dealing with the impact? The laws, right? So HR laws, HR policies and procedures, those are all dealing with the impact. And, and I want to let you in on something. Sometimes people are outside of their purpose and they're trying to change policies when they should be trying to change hearts. Right? So when we, one of the things that, uh, and I'll just put this out here, uh, first of all, police officers are human first. They are people first, and then they are blue, right? But sometimes the, 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 the pressure's on them to be blue first and human second. And when we are our role first before we are human, then we follow policies and procedures that don't necessarily benefit human beings the way that we know that they should. Right? So, so, so uh, and I also believe that police officers are doing the best they can with what they have. And even though they're out there, you know, some of them um, are using policies and procedures to, to take black people out or, or to, to oppress poor people, I'm still calling 911. If I get in trouble, I'm still calling the police. I, I hope you do the same, right? Um, so, so there's that. So impact versus intent um, and intent versus Impact. Those are uh, some important uh, things to kind of think about. Um, if you turn to the next page, I, I talk a little bit about what evil is. Um, and I use this from um, the D Duluth model of, of domestic violence. But I think if you look at other social ills around isms, um, just right down here at the, at the bottom. And uh, I'll make sure you get it. Um, You'll see uh, the, the two wheels, the D Duluth model of domestic violence, of power and control wheel, and um, you can see how that gets used to uh, stimulate and keep people trapped in other uh, isms, so not just um, sexual and domestic violence. Um, so if you turn to the next page, we'll, do, um, we'll actually we'll come back to that one. Uh, Flip to the, the last page that looks like this. That looks like this. And I want you to tell me what is happening in this picture. Which one? Uh, the picture right up at, at the uh, top. American yep. The American girl in Italy. What is happening in that picture? Harassment. What do you notice? Harassment. Sexual harassment. Okay. Like two guys on a bike. Yep, two guys on a on a moped on a on a Vespa. She what else? Looks very uncomfortable. She looks very uncomfortable. Yeah. Cat calling. Because she's not used so they're cat calling. That, 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 that he, it reminds me of uh, when I was in Spain and I was pregnant and the there were guys whistling at me and stuff and. I was offended because my culture, men didn't do that uh -huh. when you were, I want to be respected, right. right? And I remember telling my landlord, who was Spanish, I said, why do, are they doing this? Do they think I'm a street girl or something? And right. he said, 
No, he said, in our culture, we see a pregnant woman is so beautiful, and they're letting you know, wow, you're so beautiful. Right? Yeah. And that's such a great thing. So then they changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, bring it on. <laughs> like, hey, right? Hey, okay. and then I, I felt like I was being respected. Yeah. So it reminds me is maybe she doesn't understand the culture. Okay, so maybe she doesn't understand the culture. And she's um, taking it wrong. What? And she might be taking it wrong. How does she? Does she look like she's accepting of this? No. no. Right. She almost looks as if she's being assaulted. At least from my perspective, like she's being assaulted scared. by this activity. Yeah, she's scared. scared. All right. So when she gets to wherever she's going, and when she gets to work, is she going to give one hundred percent of her best? Given this kind of situation? No. Probably not. She's tired right? already. She might be tired already. Before she even gets started on whatever, wherever she's going, she might be tired. The fatigue of kind of dealing with this stuff all the time. Right? Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you see anything illegal happening in this picture? No. No. So is this sexual harassment? So it depends, A, on her experience. But from what we can see in the picture, no. She doesn't appear feeling safe. So she doesn't appear, appear feeling safe. But they're not doing anything no. they're not hurting wrong. Right. Physically. They're not right? So they may not be hurting her physically, uh, but, but they're not doing anything wrong. But are they giving an investment into her humanity through this yes. picture? You think you think they're investing in her humanity, given what you see in this picture? That they're helping to build her up, to to encourage her, to say, "Go ahead and live your potential," based on how we're treating you right now. No, no. right? So when we start talking about micro inequities, what we're talking about are these small things that try to divest people of their humanity, that try to make people not feel human. Now, here's the interesting thing. We, we, uh, the, 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 um, the point that I started with around, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the reproductive process. When two humans engage in the reproductive process, they produce a human, human right? But micro inequities tries to say that you are what? Less than. Less than human. Right? So I don't have to treat you with dignity and honor and respect because you're less than human. Right? So we'll, we'll spend some time talking about some of those things. Um, microaggressions um, and micro inequities diminish discretionary effort. What is discretionary effort? Where you guys decide how much effort you're going to Yeah. So I, can, if, if I sign a contract, and in my contract, the, the expectation is that I will at least give 75%. Right? At, at the least, they will pay me if I just give 75%. What they want is 100% of, of my talent, of my time, of my attention. Right? But between that 75% and that 100% is up to whose discretion? It's up to my discretion. Right? And why, when do I give 100%? When you choose to. When I choose to, but why would I choose to? Because I feel good, because I feel right, because I feel safe. Right? Now, if someone tries to coerce me into giving 100%, how does that work? Right? So it may appear to them that I'm giving 100% because they're coercing me to do it, but in all actuality, they're not getting everything because I'm not going to give them everything. Right? We um, could sign an employee um, agreement giving 100% all of the time. Like, really? Really? No, you can't do that. Yeah. Right? Well, I give 101. <laughs> yeah, I love when people say that too. I'm, I give 110 percent to this. I'm like, how do you determine whether you're doing 100 percent? Yeah, and and that it's a trap, is what yeah, it yeah. is, right? Trap. So it's a trap. So in, in that particular case, when you have an employee sign that, uh, you know, I'd be like. I don't know that I can sign this because who determines that? How often does that get determined? And yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, the funny part of that is, I, so I work in a senior care facility. Uh -huh. I work with people in memory care. And one time I'm walking down the hall and one of the 
residents from memory care read my shirt and didn't. And she read it as giving 10% um, all the time. I was like, yeah, yeah. you do that. <laughs> <laughs> giving your tithe. <laughs> <laughs> Right. All right. Um, and also, um, it diminishes inclusive environments, so it doesn't uh, allow us to, to live to our, our fullest potential. Um, it decreases cultural continuity, and that just means how we're able to pass things on from one generation to another. Um, it diminishes our personal best because we don't feel like we can or or want to, in some insta instances, give our personal best, and it diminishes. Um, our ability to empower ourselves. So it diminishes that safety, that significance, and that belonging. Um, and those are some ways that that, that comes up. Um, micro inequalities refer to the ways in which individuals are either um, singled out, overlooked, ignored, or otherwise discounted based on unchangeable characteristics such as race or gender. And there are other methods that are used to discount human beings. Uh, discretionary effort refers to the quality, amount, and attitude in which a person uh, chooses to give towards the completion uh, of a contract or obligation based on their perceived quality of their personal and emotional experiences. Right, so th that's discretionary effort. Um, so let, let's turn, let's flip back to. Uh, some of the uh, examples of microaggressions, um, and, and I'll let you read this, these charts on your own, uh, at your own time, but I think you'll see um, some commonalities in, in some of the themes <coughs> that when we don't honor people's humanity, we actually are in the process of creating the illusion, oh, this was my other point, the creating the illusion that they're not human, right? So, uh, if people treat me poorly, and I, I, I feel like this microaggression is coming towards me. They are trying to seduce me into a way of thinking that is not true. So if someone tries to treat me as less than human, they can never do that. Why? Why? Because I'm always human. So even if they treat me counter to what is true about me, it doesn't diminish the trueness of my existence. I am always human. Whether you want to let me sit at the, the counter and eat lunch with you or not, or drink from the same water fountains or not, that has nothing to do with what is true, which is I am human. And so when we start talking about the, these concepts of, of, of micro-inequities, that's why th that humanness becomes so important, because we can get uh, confused by all of these uh, e extraneous ways of, of thinking and, and, and talking about the world and not hold true to what is true about each and every one of us, which is that we're human. And so how do you insulate yourself, or how do you insulate your clients with this stuff? Well, one of the things that you can do is understand that there's dignity and honor in being human. What is dignity? What's dignity? Respecting yourself. Respecting yourself, okay. Dignity. So worthiness, being being worthy. What is, what is Seeking dignity? Seeking places where you feel safe and a place of belonging and significance. Okay. So finding those places where you can create that. All right. Is dignity something that you um, have or something you can give? Give. No, I think you have no idea. Yes, I'm very inherent in every person. So it is actually both. You can have dignity, but you can also give dignity. Right? Yeah. One of the things that, that I do with. Um, when I see people with the, their signs on the side of the roads, or, or I'll see someone who, um, not, not even necessarily see someone in, in distress, but uh, I have uh, paid for someone's meal before. I have, um, you know, kind of paid it forward in the coffee line at, the, at my coffee shop. Um, 
I have conversations with uh, people who look like they're having a hard time on the street, you know, either holding a sign or, or, or pushing a cart or, or whatever. Um, I have conversations with those individuals. And why do I do that? I try to give them their dignity back, right? Give One them of, hope. And give them hope. One of the things I thought was really interesting, and I had to check myself. So there's a, a, an older gentleman in, in, my, in my religious community who um, obviously uh, can't cut his grass himself, right? Big yard, can't cut his grass himself because he's tried a couple of times and he's fallen down or some other things have happened. And so uh, I, I made the mistake of going up to him and saying, you know what, if you ever need your grass cut, give me a call. Mm -hmm. well, mistake. Mm -hmm. Why was that a mistake? Because he caused you every day. Well, because well, he's he that he can't do it himself. Oh, he needs yeah. the help. Yeah. So I mean, like, I want it. Out. Right? It's enabling. And guess what happened? He didn't call. Mm -hmm. Why did he not call? Because he didn't want to, because I did not give him dignity in that thing. And so what I, so what I did was I turned it around. I said, you know what, on, on Tuesday, I'm going to be in your neighborhood. I'm just going to stop by, and, uh, and, and maybe we can, we can talk. Now, I knew he needed his grass cut. He knew he needed his grass cut. But him asking me robbed him of his, his dignity. So I gave him what he needed, Right? Didn't cost me anything, but I gave him what he needed. Uh, the next, honor. Hello, how are you? Come on in. Come on in, have a seat. Um, the, the next is honor. And what is honor? No, 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 I, I have plenty. Showing respect is honoring someone. So honor is showing respect. All right, what else is honor? Who do we reserve honor for? To, for the president, People, right? Mother and father. Mother and father. Who do we give honor to? People judges. Of high importance. People of high importance. Judges, right? We reserve uh, honor because honor is the highest level of respect. Can you imagine what it might feel like for your clients to get your highest level of respect? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. Right? And it's so funny, it's, un it's almost unsettling to people because I refer to uh, even young people as ma'am and sir. I say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And they're like, why are you calling me? Why, why are you? Because I'm trying to teach you something about respect. Now, I'm not saying that you have to say ma'am and sir to show respect. I think respect is a place that you operate from in your heart. But um, in, in terms of um, an outward of showing of that, that's one of the ways it shows itself, right? Um, one of the things that I do not do is I don't pass school buses. I don't pass them. Why? Those lives on that bus are so important to my future. I need somebody to pay Social Security, so I'll have some. Right? <laughs> right? So, 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 so respect shows that. Now, and here's the, the, the funny thing about respect is that it is not authentic until you are respectful in the face of being disrespected. Oh. It's not authentic until the person has spat in your face and you say, you know what? This might not be a good time for us to, 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 to meet, but we are going to meet again. We're going to work through this again. Although this might not be the time, right? Because you can't treat me like this and think that we're going to continue, but I'm not going to let you go. When we talk about you know dignity, honor, and being human, please raise your hand if you purchased a ticket or you passed a test that made it eligible for you to be born. None of us have done anything to bring ourselves here. We've all responded to an invitation, and I don't like to think about how that invitation came because it's disgusting. But uh, we all accepted an invitation, and we're trying to figure out what it means to be human. And the interesting thing about human is that it has two definitions. One is to be a biped, have opposable thumbs, a big brain, and a belly button. If you ever encounter a person without a belly button, be concerned. <laughs> All right? Homo sapiens sapiens, the one who knows that they know they exist. And the human is also what? An adjective. And what do adjectives do? Describe. They describe what? 
a noun. A noun. And so what are the adjectives of, of humanity? How do we describe ourselves to the youngest of our species? What are our hopes and dreams for those folks? What does it mean to be human? Compassionate. To be compassionate. Loving kindness. Loving and kind. Understanding. To be understanding. Giving. To be giving. To be imperfect. To be imperfect. Reaching your potential. To reach your potential. Right? That's the highest uh, uh, of, our, of our human ideals. And at the same time, we also recognize that there are some dark places in our humanity as well, right? That we can be greedy, we can be self-serving, that we can be divisive, and that we ultimately can be murderous. To be spiritual. Right? To be spiritual. These are all aspects of what it means to be human. And so how do we diminish the impacts of micro inequities um, as they show up in that, in that chart? We make sure that people have the dignity and honor in being human. And we have to give it to them whether they give it to us or not. Whether they're respectful to us or not. Right? Um, just a couple of macro boosters. Um, macro boosters are the, the large way that, that organizations show individuals that they are appreciated and valued. Um, and people try to associate macro boosters with raises. But that's the best way to show people that, that they're valued by organizations. Is that necessarily true? No. 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 Appreciation. Right? So, so there may be other forms of appreciation, specifically around looking at safety, significance, and belonging. So some folks are motivated by one of those three more than, than other folks. Right? Um, macro boosters in, in terms of uh, how to increase people's uh, effectiveness. These are the small ways in which individuals show that they're appreciated and valued. Most of these do not uh, involve money, right? So how do you show people that you're, that you're interested and involved, that you want to, um, cre um, to help bolster their humanity? What are some simple ways you can do that? Listen. listen. So you can listen to them. How else? Ask about their kids or family. You can ask about their, their kids or their family. Be assistant. You can be an assistant to them. You can help them out. What else? Coach them. You can coach them. them. You learn from them. You thank them. You thank them. Do, do you know that a good thank you will go a long way? You can right? advocate for them. You can advocate for them, right? So those are some, those are some things that we can think about. Um, because if we don't, then what we end up is in hostile, um, hostile environments. And so if you look down at that, that bottom of the, the, the corner there, what you'll see are some, some things to avoid a hostile environment. These are environments that continually um, drive people away from their humanity. And so one of the things that we know about a hostile environment, that no off-color jokes are funny. No off-color jokes. Now, and and off-color jokes would be those, those kinds of jokes that you would not say in front of that person or that group of people if they were present. Right? Um, th those aren't funny. And even... Um, even Ole and Lena jokes, um, I don't know if folks are familiar with that, that style of joking, right, um, can be problematic because if you separate, if you uh, uh, take Ole and Lena out of the joke and you put in Jew or you put in Pole or you put in Black in the place of Ole and Lena, it starts to take on a whole different way of, of, of thinking. And so those, or, or, or Blonde versus Brunette. So those things become... Um, Jokes, uh, jokes are problematic, particularly if you don't do it for a living. Or Native American. Right? Yeah, or Native American. So you add those, and it changes the color. Uh, oh, that didn't mean that. It changes the nature uh, 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 of the joke, right? Um, and no, no sexual or gender jokes are, are ever funny. I, I, uh, I don't know if anyone's seen this television show, Blackish. But I, I thought it was very interesting, this, this last episode, it's on ABC. I'm not sure if I like it or not, so I keep watching it to try to figure it out, because um, it makes me just, it's, it's unnerving, and I'm, I'm not, I haven't figured out why. Um, but the basic premise is, this, you know, this urban city guy finally makes it, he and his family are living in, um, in, in um, their, their upper middle class, um, and so his kids are having this totally different experience than himself. And his wife is, um, is biracial by hippie parents. And so it's just this crazy dynamic around, you know, what is, what is black. But uh, so, so in this last episode, 
um, the uh, the protagonist um, Andre ironically, <laughs> uh, goes to his boss because the the guy who played Santa Claus at his office party dies, and so. He wants the position, but he doesn't say that he wants the position. So he goes up to, to the supervisor and says, Hey, um, when you're thinking about the Santa, I want you to think outside of the box. I want you to think non-traditionally about, about Santa. And the, the supervisor says, Well, you know what? I wasn't going to do that, but now you got me thinking. I think I'm, I am going to do that. And so now he's salivating. He's excited because... He, you know, the announcement's going to be made. And so he brings folks around the water cooler and says, we're announcing our new Santa, and the Santa this year is the, is the, um, the uh, Hispanic female HR officer. <laughs> and so Drake is upset because he says... She can't jump the line. <laughs> Everybody knows that it's supposed to be a, a white Santa, then a black Santa, then a female Santa, <laughs> then a Hispanic. You know. And so he, he goes down this thing. And so what, what we have to understand is before we were racist, we were sexist. And that, that runs just as deep as all these other forms. And so those jokes don't become funny either. Can I um, ask one yes, thing? sir. Richard Pryor, though, would be out of business. Yeah, he would be. And, and, and so, comedy should be left to the professionals. But who are those? The, the people who get paid to tell the jokes. But if they're off color. No, they can, you know, and, and, and as far as. This is in the workplace. Right. So I don't want, I, I don't necessarily think we need, uh, I don't want us to fight wars, but I need, we need. Soldiers. And so I don't necessarily like those jokes, but sometimes um, we need to be able to look at ourselves in the. Um, in the George Carlin did a wonderful job of help, helping us to look at ourselves using comedy mm -hmm. in a specific kind of way. And I think Richard Pryor did, did the same, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so we need those people, but here's, <coughs> here, here comes the problem. When a. Uh, a a school does plays based off of Richard does a uh, a rich does a Richard Pryor skit at a school assembly. That's a problem because they're not professionals, right? And so when we tell these jokes at work, and we're not pro that's not what we're getting paid to do. That's a problem, right? So no. The, the, if that's their profession, go for it. You want to be off color and that's your profession, go for it. But when we're at work, when I'm in the school district, they're not paying me to tell jokes. It's, they're paying me to teach kids, right? The other piece is that I have a choice as to whether or not I want to go see that comedian. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's in the workplace and it's being said, I don't have choice about which sharing Which things. creates that hostile environment, right? right? Um, the last couple of things... Um, Sometimes, number three, people say, uh, I, I didn't mean it, no offense. Mm -hmm. right? Or they'll say, you know how Bob is, that's just Bob. Right? Mm -hmm. No, it's not just Bob, it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It's just wrong. Um, I had a situation where I, I had to, to help a, a, a high-ranking uh, government, government official work through um, some sexual harassment stuff. Because they were saying some stuff to, to staff, and people were like, well, he's just old. That's just how it is. I was like, tell that to an attorney. Mm -hmm. The attorney, attorney would salivate over some of the things that this person has said. Dude, we got to get this person some help. <laughs> right? Um, number, number five, say something. Um, number six, remember that work is about work. And, and whether I make friends or not may help me do my work, but it's not, a, a, it's not necessary for me to do my work. And then lastly, know that no means no. So if someone says, no, don't tell that joke. No, I don't want to go out for lunch with you. No, blah, blah, blah. Take that as, as, as it is. Otherwise, once you proceed past that no, you are <laughs> creating um, opportunities for the organization and yourself to be liable for, for harassment. But if you remember to always give people dignity, honor, and being human, you'll never run into any of these problems. And microaggressions can be resolved just by following that simple phrase. 
that there's dignity and honor in being human and that people deserve that, not because of what they are or where they come from, but because they exist. And if you flip to the last page on the back, um, one of the, the, the problems is that um, you know, racism, sexism, heterosexism, um, all uh, disability uh, or lack of access uh, for people with disabilities um, creates a void in the, in, in the soul. So it starts to separate the body and the spirit. And when that void gets formed, um, free market capitalism is ready to take its place, to fill that void. You can buy what you need. Um, you know, the, the only commercials that's ever made me feel good about myself have been the herpes commercials. Uh, all the other, because I, those herpes commercials, those people are living the life. You know, they're bungee jumping and, and skydiving and all that other stuff. Uh, I don't want herpes to have to experience that or use their drugs to. But the point being is that all these other commercials tell me about how my hair is not good enough, how I'm not uh, the right shape, or I, if I buy this, um, this body spray, indiscriminate women will follow me and, and throng and, and on me and all that kind of stuff in, in an effort for me to fill my soul. But what we've learned from Robin Williams and um, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman is that you can have the whole world, you can have all the trappings of success, but if you have a hole in your soul, you can't fill it but with one thing, which is what? Drugs. The, you can try to fill it with drugs, right? Right? And that's what they've done. They've tried to fill it with drugs. But how much, how much can you smoke? How much can you snort to fill a hole in your soul? Elvis taught us that. Janis Joplin taught us that. Jimi Hendrix taught us that. Uh, I would go as far as to say Michael Jackson even taught us that. That you can't medicate yourself to wholeness. The only way you become whole is reuniting that, 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 that human spirit. And what Alfred Adler tells us um, over and over again, and, and, and other philosophers have also told us that we are not inseparable. We are a united human being. You can't separate yourself. Um, although capitalism typically tries to do that, because when the body is without the spirit, it becomes a thing. And when the spirit is without the body, it becomes powerless. And so if I can, um, w one of the things that was very interesting about the transatlantic slave trade was it's the, 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 the mechanism itself was not just to, to get free labor, but it was to turn human beings into things. So to dehumanize or trick people into thinking that they weren't human to the point that they started acting and behaving as chattel, as things. Just um, like Hitler and the Holocaust. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing is that um, the, 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 the eugenics movement that, that spurred the Holocaust was actually birthed in the United States. So, so Hitler learned how to do what he did from the transatlantic slave trade here in the United and States. Herbert Spencer, right? Like Herbert yep. Spencer. yep, yep, yep. And so last one, we talk about liberation. The, these are some things to think about in terms of liberation. Um, we, we started out saying that there are people on the top and people on the bottom. And so our, our uh, and we said that that's unjust, that there shouldn't be people on the top and there shouldn't be people on the bottom. And so what we've said is let's reverse that. So we'll take the people off the bottom and put them on the top and take the people off the top and put them on the bottom. And then we also found that that was not um, an equitable system either. So, you said, so we said, you know what, let's get everybody on top of the table. And so we'll, we'll get everybody on top of the table, and then we'll have an equitable system. And then we found out that there wasn't enough room on the table for, to, to have everybody on the table. So we said, you know what, we will have separate but equal tables. So you're on that side of the table, and I'll be on this side of the table. And we found that to also not be uh, an equitable system. So we said, you know what, let's get everybody on the same side of the table. And true liberation does not happen until when? Till no we wrong. stop comparing ourselves to the table. Because the problem has, has typically been that the systems that we've operated in that have told us about ourselves. I find it very interesting when your enemy names you. I find, I find it interesting when your enemy has a name for you. And I find it interesting the backlash that comes when you have a name for yourself. So, so uh, you know, who do other people...
other people say you are versus who do you say you are? And so when we get to this point where people, we help people to define themselves without regard for what the table says about them. Or titles. Or titles, right? So my parents did not have a lot of money, but we were never poor. Statistically, and in, in, in looking at uh, the finances, we were below the poverty line, but we were never poor. Because our clothes were always clean. We always held our heads high. We, we bought what we could afford. We did not steal from anyone. We did not lie, cheat, or, or, or rob anyone for what we had because that poverty was not a part of us. We knew that being poor was a temporary status. And so we, we operated like that. You know, my, my, my mother made our clothes when, when, when she could. And, and so when we start talking about this, this liberation model, when we get to a place where people don't have to compare themselves to the system, um, then micro inequities don't even matter. When everyone's poor, you're rich. When everyone's poor, you're rich, right? And when everybody is rich, you're everybody's rich. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, so, so that's the end of the lecture. We could go on for, for uh, much longer. I really appreciate your, your time and your energy. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll continue to have these. So uh, circulate this to your friends and, and family and tell them Thank you. you can do it. You're welcome. Thanks. You need these? Um, yes. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yes. Yeah. Well, what was the other one? Nice to meet you. Oh, hi there. Oh, hi there. Yeah, I was doing over at Hamlet. Uh, he knew that I was going to be here. Yeah. So he told me about it, so I'll give him an opportunity to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, uh, um, um, let's make sure that we communicate if there are other students that you know that benefit from some of these in the sessions. Yeah, it's like a uh, 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 socially progressive school, technically. I don't know why it's David Wright's and Four things on campus for students. Is it cash? No, that's somebody. Uh, uh, there's one sandwich. Uh, so it's like a large budget, uh, large, successful BSU, and things like that. Yeah. So, uh,